Hi, it's Kate, and this is the third video for week three of Math 23. We've learned a lot of new terms so far, and we're going to keep investigating these ideas of linear combinations, span, linear independence, linearly dependent vectors, so on and so forth. So let's jump right in. This little section is about how to find a vector that's outside the span of a given set of vectors. So the first thing is, is that say we're given a set of vectors, we have k vectors here, v1 through vk, they live in Fn, and our chore is to find or prove that these, this set of vectors, this collection, does not span Fn. So our task at hand is that we want to find a vector w that is not a linear combination of v1 through vk. It cannot be written as a sum of scalar multiples of v1 through vk. So how do we go about doing that? While we go through these steps, I'm going to give you an actual concrete example. Say that we are in R3, and I want you to show me that these two vectors, V1 and V2, there they are, that they do not span R3. So our task is to find this mystery vector, W, that cannot be written as a linear combination of V1 and V2. So it says here that our first step is to create an n by k matrix A whose columns are the given vectors. Well, note that k is the number of vectors, in this case we have two, and n is the dimension, the number of components that we have in the space that we're working in, in this case we're three. So we now have a, a three by two matrix A whose columns are the given vectors. All we have to do is, here's the first column, here's the second column. So let's write that down. All right, the next step is to row reduce this particular matrix, this one right here, and form the product E of the elementary matrices that accomplish the row reduction. So there are two ways to tackle that, like we said before. We can either row reduce it and write down every single step and then find the product E like this, where this is a pretty big product. Each of these are the steps in order, step one, step two, step three, the steps of the row reduction rep as represented by elementary matrices, and you can calculate that product if you're really excited about, I don't know, matrix products. Or the alternative is if you refer back to page four under the row reduction by elementary matrices topic, remember that another way to find E really quickly is to append the identity matrix onto A. So turn this matrix into this matrix into, into this one, note that I've stuck on a three by three identity matrix because that's the one that fits alongside here. Then in our mind, you sort of want to keep these two things separate. On this side, we have A and on this side, we have I. And then if we row reduce it, this is what we get. And remember that on here is A prime, so to speak. And on this side, we have B, and in fact, this right here is E. That is the matrix that when we take E multiplying A on the left, we will get the fully row reduced version of A. So we have this matrix E that adequately, adequately, pardon me, row reduces A into this, and clearly what we're missing here is a pivotal one down in this bottom row. And so what we're looking for is a particular vector, w, whose row reduced form gives us that third pivotal one. So we need some vector such that this is what happens to it. We basically want to attach this vector w onto a so that when e multiplies it on the left, remember that whatever is over here on the right, it's just how the columns are interacting with E. So this column of A gives us 1, 0, 0 when it has E act on it. This column of A gives 0, 1, 0 when E acts on it. And so we need some third column that would go here so that we would get 0, 0, 1 when E multiplies it on the left. And remember also from our previous discussion that this E is invertible. So the key to figure out what W actually is, is to multiply by E inverse on the left. Let's do that. So this is what it looks like very basically. We have 
E inverse times E times W on the right-hand side of the equation, and sorry, I've run out of room, and we want to multiply by E inverse on the left. On the other side of the equation as well, so we have E inverse times 0, 0, 1, and if you calculate what E inverse is from this, you'll find that E inverse times 0, 0, 1 gives you 0, 1, 0, and so that's our W. On the left-hand side, E inverse and E cancel to the identity, so we're left with W. E inverse acting on 0, 0, 1, I used uh, Mathematica to do this for me. 0, 1, 0 is what I got. And so W, 0, 1, 0, is a vector that is outside of the span of our V1 and V2. And so that's what this is essentially saying, is that, okay, the original set of vectors span F, we have our row reduced matrix right here, and we need to look at where we're missing the pivotal one. In this case, we were missing the pivotal one in the bottom, so we want something, some column, some vector, that would be the third column of A, right, in here, that when E, the row reducing matrix, multiplies it on the left, it would give me that final pivotal one that I am missing. And so since E is invertible, I'm able to multiply by its inverse on the left, and so that gives me W on the left, and it gives me the vector that's outside of the span on the right. Because remember that pivotal ones mean that those vectors are linearly independent from the vectors listed before it. An important note is down here at the bottom, right here. So note that if k is less than n, the number of vectors is fewer than the number of components used to define the space. So for instance, you have two vectors in this case, but we're in R3 up here. So the number of vectors is less than the number of components you use to identify a particular element of R3. So what this is saying is that if that's the case, the fully row reduced matrix where each column is a vector must have a row of zeros at the bottom. It must. So it follows that the vector that we're always looking for is E, because remember we want to rearrange our rows when we row reduce so that the row of zeros always goes at the bottom. So it follows that the vector that is always outside of the span can be found by taking E inverse and multiplying it by the standard basis vector that would give us the pivotal one in the right place, which is one at the bottom, E n. In this case, n for us was three, so it was E three was uh, the vector that we were multiplying by E inverse on the left. And that that is how we can find the vector each and every time that is outside the span of the set that we're already given. And you're probably already thinking to yourself about the second proof that you guys will be responsible for, that in Rn, n plus 1 vectors will never be linearly independent, and n minus 1 vectors will never span. And we'll get into how that's true and how to prove it uh, as we move on. Let's take a look at image, kernel, and the dimension formula. There's a lot of new vocabulary in this section, so go slowly as you're reviewing it on your own. We start out with a linear transformation T that maps from Rn to Rm. It's represented by a matrix because matrices can represent linear transformations. The first word that is probably new to you is image. And the image of T is the set of vectors that lie in the subspace spanned by the columns of T. So if you're looking at the columns of the matrix that represents this linear transformation, you think of each column as a vector and this set of vectors and what they span. Remember all the possible linear combinations of that set of vectors. That is the image. Another way to think about the image is that it is the set of all possible outputs. It lives in the codomain, but it is not the same thing as the codomain. For instance, look at this example, and I'm just going to use a normal function. It's not a linear transformation, but a usual function. Let's take a look at f. Here's an example. f is a function written f of x equals x squared. And when you write it in functional notation, that means that it's domain is the real numbers, right? It takes one real number where you plug it in and it spits out a real number. So it maps from R to R. 
Now, when you think of domain and codomain, that means its domain is R, all real numbers, and its codomain is also R, all real numbers. But when you look at this actual function, what are the possible outputs of this function? Well, you know that it's the squaring function, so there are no square roots when we're going from the reals to the reals that are negative. So we know that the image of this function is all the real numbers that are greater than or equal to zero. So this guy is the codomain, this one is the image. So that's a way of thinking about the image and how it is, it's a subspace of RM. It lives in RM, but it may not be the entire space of RM. And the way to figure out what the subspace actually is, is to look at each column of T individually and think of that as a set of vectors, and it's the linear, all the possible linear combinations of that set. Okay, we already said that the image of T is a subspace of RM, as I explained here. Its dimension is R. That's the rank of the matrix T. So when we talk about the rank of a particular matrix, that means the dimension of the space where, the subspace where this matrix is mapping us to. Let's take a look at some implications of that. That means that a solution to the system of equations T acting on a mystery vector X equals B is guaranteed to exist, though it may not be unique, if and only if the image of T is M dimensional. So if the image and the codomain have the same dimension, then a solution to the system of equations like this is guaranteed to exist. We're going to play more with these, so don't be too concerned if it's still fuzzy what's going on here. We're going to do a lot of examples. Well, first of all, you might be wondering, okay, the image is a subspace. The image is the set of all the subspace that we're mapping to. How do I find a basis for it? Well, we use the columns of the matrix T. Remember that a basis is really picky because a basis is a set of vectors that are linearly independent from each other. So what we do is we take the matrix T, we row reduce it, and we take a look at the pivotal columns, and the pivotal columns correspond to the vectors that are linearly independent from each other. So to find a basis for the image, we take T, we use the columns of the matrix T, we row reduce them, the ones that end up with a pivotal one in them correspond to the columns that are linearly independent and those will give us the basis. Alright, the kernel of T, kernel, another very important word, is the set of vectors for which the linear transformation acting on those vectors returns a zero. So you can think of it like the zeros of a function when you're thinking about a linear transformation. That's the kernel of T. A lot of students, when they first think about image and kernel, they think that these two things exist in the same place. They don't. Remember that the image of T is a subspace of RM. It's a subspace of the codomain. The kernel is the zeros of T. So it's the set of vectors that return a zero when T acts on it. So that lives in the domain. The kernel is part of the domain. The image is part of the codomain. Note that the kernel of T is a subspace of Rn, just like we said it lives here. Kernel lives here, image lives here. Kernel, image. Okay. Note that a system of equations, T acting on X equals B, has a unique solution if and only if the kernel of that transformation is zero-dimensional. When we mean zero-dimensional, that means that the only vector that lies in the kernel is the zero vector. I'm going to write that down as a note. When you have a zero dimensional kernel, the only vector in the kernel is the zero vector. You'll see that that's not always true of some of these matrices. All right, there is an algorithm for constructing an independent vector in the kernel of T from each of the n minus r non pivotal columns of T. Remember that you're probably like, n minus r non pivotal columns? What? Well, remember the total number of columns is n in this matrix, and the number of columns that give us a pivotal one is R. 
So n minus r corresponds to when you take the matrix T and you row reduce it, the ones that don't have pivotal columns in that. n total columns minus r pivotal one columns. So n minus r is the non-pivotal columns. You can take a look at this algorithm in Hubbard. It's quite straightforward as far as a procedure, and we're going to do it uh, several times in the homework and the small group problems and the sample problems. Note that the dimension of the image is R, the number of pivotal columns. The dimension of the kernel, since each of the non-pivotal columns gives us an element of the kernel through this algorithm, which you can look up, the dimension of the kernel is N minus R. So this is very important. This is called the rank nullity theorem. And it means that the dimension of the image of a linear transformation plus the dimension of the kernel of the linear transformation is equal to n, which is the dimension of its domain. We're going to play around with some of the implications of that later, but take a moment. A lot of this won't be entirely clear to you until we start working on problems that really involve the image and the kernel, but having an idea in your head about how the image is different from the codomain but a subspace of it, and how the kernel is a subspace of the domain, and a general idea of the dimension of the image and the dimension of the kernel is where you should be by the end of this coming week.